Episode number one, Marina Svita Eva, part one. Hello, welcome to this podcast about the life and work of Marina Svita Eva. Every Friday, we will share a personal view on the life of an author, which we will study through a poem or a book. The idea is not to establish a rigorous system of ideas, but just to share some intimate and personal impressions. If you are interested in a specific poem or author, do not hesitate to send us a message. Today we read Marina Svita Eva, a Russian author born in Moscow in 1892. In the bosom of an aristocratic family, she was raised in a privileged cultural environment by her father, a museum curator, and her mother, a pianist. Quite conservative in their tastes and values, she was involved in literary education from an early age. Although, according to the tale, My Mother and Music, which is part of her complete autobiography, her mother was disgusted by Marina's lack of musical spirit. Her mother's strong influence in her lyrical work, which is full of sonority, stands out. This is today's poem. Enjoy it. I know the truth. Renounce all others. There's no need for anyone to fight. For what? Poets, generals, lovers... Look, it's night luck. Almost night. Ah, the wind falls. The earth is wet with dew. Ah, the snow will freeze, the moving stars. And soon, under the earth, we'll sleep too. Who would never be left to sleep above? October 3rd, 1915. In this poem, there is a doom foretold. It is a time when death seems to burst into Marina's life and heart. The discontent of the poorest people crossed Russia from one side to the other, from industrialized Moscow to the most backward lands in the agrarian economy of the Great Steppers and Eastern Provinces. The apocalyptic outcome of the fall of the Tsars was approaching. The power of the royal family was collapsing before the helpless eyes of those who believed in tradition and royal power. Already since the year of the writing of the poem, the Bolsheviks, the Red Party, was being formed, led by Marxist experts, young people of the revolution, who with their anti-capitalist ideals made significant advances and managed to convince a large portion of the peasantry to undertake a struggle against the authoritarian and ineffective power of their king. It was not surprising that such an oppressive environment pushed Marina to think about what she calls the truth, which is, which is exactly the end of her life not only in an idealistic, ideological posture, but that her actions would push her to leave the comfort of her aristocratic family to mingle with the revolutionaries, including her husband, Sergei Efron. The first line of this poem is a strong statement. It asks us to renounce belief, because death is already advancing and winning the game. To fight means clearly to go against a human and anthropological correlation Man is not only a set of ideas or philosophical postulates, but is composed of matter. Everyone is included, regardless of social condition. The poets who have been hidden, the generals idolized, and lovers idealized. She asks to observe the night and insists that it is already getting dark. The punctuation up to this point should be emphasized, with its constant exclamation points, question marks, commas, double periods. Following this is the exclamation, Aha! The wind continues its work. The earth wakes up to a new day, and for her everything seems the same. It is people's lives that are no longer the same, and are uncertain. The universe is still firm, despite our disappearance. We are all heading towards that dream under the earth. Many Russians, and she herself, would do the same. This poem, written even in her youth, shows us a navy full of tenacity and pride, which she would never put aside. In a future podcast episode, we will continue to analyze the life and work of this Russian author, highlighting biographical and literary aspects of her work, as her life and the life of Soviet Russia progresses. Second part. Hello, thanks for listening to our content of the Lyrical Times. Subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media so you don't miss any updates. The links are in the description. In this episode, we will continue to talk about Marina Svita Eva. We said that, when she returned to her homeland, the revolution was already brewing, and she would soon meet her future husband, a man to whom she would always be tied, both for better and for worse. From this period, 
we would like to rescue an essential reading, October in Wagon. This is a book that Marino wrote in the eagerness of the outbreak of the revolution. Her first daughter had been born. She was already counting on the life of a second offspring. Marino went through a great hardship as she learned while away from her hometown that her husband had joined the White Army, formed after the outbreak of the revolution. The White Volunteer Army gathered mainly in the south, towards the more European part of Russia, where the popular clamor of the countryside was favorable to them. Gradually, however, the Soviets exerted pressure and enacted under Lenin's edict laws to usurp, kidnap, and disappear, and even assassinate any opponent of the new Bolsheviks' legislature. legislature. Sergei, who came from an insurgent family, embarked on his journey. Marina was in danger being alone. She took a train headed from a distant Tatar region to Moscow. There she would discover one of the faces of the social outbreak, the Great Famine. In her story, she narrates how crime became her daily bread. Her first short story evokes an armed robbery of her belongings. Everywhere people bow down to pay homage to Lenin. Women and men work at trade so as not to perish from the approaching winter. In the story, My Jobs, she explains how a friend of hers offered her a job to collaborate in one of the many new ministries that had been formed. Marina agreed under the promise that it would not be linked to the disappearance of any civilian. To her surprise, she discovered that it was an office of international affairs. Jews, Lithuanians, Georgians, Azerbanians, etc. gathered there in long lines, people coming from everywhere to make history in the victorious group that would cheerfully sing the Internationale. Marina's job was to organize official documents such as passports. She was the interpreter. She was fluent in several languages, including Georgian, from which she would make several translations during her adult life. She soon discovered that her bureaucratic exercise took hours away from her poetic writing. A sentence from her would clarify this desire to never again devote her time to anything else except poetry. And so it was. Many months passed, and she thought her husband had died. Marina's life was filled with darkness. Little Irina, her first daughter, died in an orphanage where she had left her believing she would have a better chance of getting out alive. Hunger attacked, and the little girl's body could not stand it. That emptiness would be reflected in hundreds of poems she would write. One of the most visceral would begin with a great questioning. I don't know where you are, or where I am. Despite all the despondency, she learned that her husband was alive in the Caucasus region. She had taken refuge with friends of his. Eventually, they decided that because of her ideals, Russia had become unbearable for them. The formation of the great Soviet Union, Soviet Union was beginning. Writers were prosecuted and censored. The living and free word no longer existed. Everyone was constantly accused. Marina immigrated together with Sergei and many other Russians. The first of their destinations was Berlin, one of the last and happiest. The family was truly content on German soil. From this period dates the important literary essay, A Prisoner Spirit, written with fervor and passion, in which the poet narrates her meeting with the Russian writer, Henry Belly, well known for his works such as The Silver Dove. The document is one of great literary value for the quality of its structure. The vocabulary, the finest expression that demonstrates the literary height of the writer. In this text, almost all her styles converge, mainly the poetic one. Marina strongly longed for poetry. However, she could not devote herself fully to it because prose was more commercial. In that sense, it could be said that her stories were strongly motivated by social circumstances, altogether nevertheless spiritual. 
Soon the family became convinced that it was not opportune to remain in Germany as economic conditions worsened. A Slovakian government scholarship for academics provided support for the family. They moved to Prague. Sergei Efron became, began studying philosophy at Charles University in Prague. This period was of certain economic and literary tranquility. Marina was at a point of fervor where every emotion and thought became a verse. She published her poems in Russian immigration magazines, La Valentad Russa, one of them. She devoted herself to taking care of her children. Soon they would have to move to France. Their son Mur was born. Marina wrote profusely during her exile. An example of this is the book of poems entitled After Russia. From this period also came her greatest narrative and poetic writings, as well as her most important essays. The family's life would begin to take a regrettable turn. The 14 years of exile in France were of great pain and sadness for Marina. She could not find herself and her creation was constantly attacked by many other writers in exile. It could be said that she was marginalized from these literary circles. Her relationship with her husband was somewhat distant, as she knew almost nothing about what was going on. That is why it is impossible for her to realize that Sergi, who missed his white homeland with all of his passion, let himself be carried away by nostalgia and established relations with other Soviet exiles who planned to apply for passports to return to the already formed Soviet Union. Marina did not know it, but her husband's purpose was to accept his participation in the White Army, show signs of repentance, and faithfully support the revolution. Sergi wanted to return to his homeland, and for that he would pay the price of being disloyal to that was his anti-Bolshevik cause during several years of exiles. He had already secretly prepared his permits. Soon his daughter, Aliyah, who also longed to return, would embark with him. The event that triggered the escape was the murder of a man, which would initiate investigations against Sergi by the French police. Marina came to learn of all of this too late. She stayed more time with Mur in France, but the emptiness of her homeland added to the lack of her husband and daughter, plus the constant tribulations she lived through due to the rejection of writers and critics was enough for her to apply for passports in 1939, after 17 years of exile. They soon boarded a ship in the Normandy region and returned. What awaited them was not much better. Her husband, along with her daughter, had been arrested for counter-espionage. In the letter Marino writes to Officer Berea, she explains everything about her life and that her husband, in an attempt to dissuade him from any kind of reprisal the authorities might take against them. The darkest period of Marina's life began. The writers' associations did not accept her, fearing that, like her husband, she was involved in acts against the Soviets. The stigmatization forced her to isolate herself. Soon her husband would be shot, although she would never know it. And her daughter would be sent to the Gulag for many years. Nazi terror was invading Europe. The mutual peace treaty signed between Stalin and Hitler was violated by the latter. And after deploying the invasion of Poland, the Nazi stormed into Russia, seeking to attack the major forts of Stalingrad. Due to the invasion and the threat to Moscow, Marina and her son were evacuated to a small residence in Yalabuga, in the inhospital region of Tartaristan. Their economic hardships and rejections from the Writers Guild would follow. Marina, desperate, requested a job as a dishwasher. By the time she was given the job, it was too late. She was deeply affected by what she had lived through. And on August 31st, 1941, at the age of 49, she decided to commit suicide in the little house she had rented and which belonged to some peasants in the region. Her son's fate would be cut short as he would die in the war. Marina died, but her work will live on and to this day is studied with praise by critics. She dedicated her life to the poetic word, and that is why her verses still resonate today. One of the most memorable quotes could be, In the spasm of death, I will also be a poet. 
This recording was made by Fernando Hernandez. The text was written by Sebastian Moreno for the Lyrical Times. Thanks for listening. Check out our social media resources.